Magandang araw mga kababayan at welcome to TV Up. This is the Science Innovation Series and today our topic is traffic and how big data might be able to help us solve our traffic problem. Our citizens are all concerned about the traffic. This is um, the walking public, the pedestrians, the commuters, those with private vehicles, and those who transport cargo uh, through our major thoroughfares. I'm Giselle Concepcion, professor at the Marine Science Institute of UP Iliman, and I have with me my co-host Benji Vallejo, professor at the Institute of Environmental Science and Meteorology. Benji? Good day to our viewers, and thank you again for having me here. We have with us two of our top young professors and scientists at the National Institute of Physics. We have Professor May Lim. Yes. Hi, May. Hello, po. And Professor Giovanni Gani Tapang. Magandang umaga po sa inyo lahat. And they are complexity science researchers. But though that's a very abstract and computational modeling field, their concerns are very down to earth. And May works on traffic as an academic scientific problem, which we think is the way to try to improve the traffic situation in our country. So May, can you please tell us about what you're doing about traffic? Okay. So when we talk about traffic, from, a, from my, uh, my team's perspective, we talk about it in several ways. One is from a modeling perspective. Sinusubukan namin, you know, pag ganito yung iniisip mo ng mga, mga tao, ano mangyayari kung hindi lang siya isang tao, marami na kayong maghahalo-halo doon? Ano mangyayari? Uh, pangalawa, we also look into data. So, if, pwede ba naming ma-validate yung model? Ma-check kung tama nga ba yung prediction? Or, and the other way is, we look at data and say, uh, are we ga gaining some insights from that? And saying, okay, if that's what data looks like, can we try to extend it into a model? And so, this feedback loop of looking at data, modeling, and then trying to make predictions is uh, essentially what we try to do when it, when it comes to uh, doing uh, complex science-based uh, analysis of traffic. So, may do we have data, or for that matter, big data? Meron na ba? Well, there's opportunistic data, <laughs> but not really big data in the you know, sense that I want, for example, this resolution, uh, let's say per second or every 15 seconds, I would like to know where the buses are. That's hard. But well, there's opportunistic data in the sense that uh, Google Maps, for example, would show you the load, the volume of traffic in a certain given segment. MMDA posts an update every 15 minutes uh, for certain uh, points in Metro Manila. So those are the opportunistic data that, that's available right now. But if you want better data, we, there's data, but it's not in our hands. Okay. So I think Benji has a lot of questions. Um, um, well, as um, somebody so affected by traffic, so... Yeah, uh, well, my question for me would be this. Uh, when you say traffic, are we referring to people, individual people, or the vehicles? Oh, uh, when we do uh, some of our models, we look at uh, vehicles, but it, we've also, we also look into people, because there's also pedestrian traffic. And I think as we move on, because we've, we've started with essentially what look like, what look like toy models. Marang laruan lang siya na, okay, may kotse ka na ganito, susunod na ganito, ano mangyayari? Mm -hmm. Even those toy models, they give a lot of insights. But then we also know that, for example, we have uh, models wherein we have people, we would say, okay, these are the people you say, move. What, mm -hmm. what would they do? How do, would they approach a certain door, for example? And, and this one has actually done with Gani a long time ago. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, mm. so there are those kinds of models. And so when we sit, talk about traffic, we actually want to talk about everyone. We want to talk about movement, not just of people. We want to talk about movement of people at different scales, you know, walking from one end of, let's say, Katipunan to the other. Well, that's too much, actually. But for example, just walking, 
uh, point A to B, even from the parking lot to your destination, it's part of the walking experience. Then we say movement of cars, and then the movement of cargo, and movement yes. of goods. Yes. So when you say traffic, it should actually be a huge uh, infrastructure, a huge idea that traffic is about moving the movement of people, goods, services. So may the uh, model is only as good as the data, right? So uh, maybe we can ask uh, Gane about gathering uh, the data objectively, not subjectively. And also earlier, we were talking about your initiatives in NIP about how to ease the traffic uh, from your vehicles in NIP. Yes, yes. ma'am. Um, as May has said, uh, we were working on this when we were graduate students. Uh, it really started at with toy models. But the real problem is it's not really just traffic. It's uh, the whole question of transporting things. So it's a transportation issue. And the problem with this is, of course, scale. Now, I have uh, some students who are working, for example, in just looking at the pedestrian traffic inside UP. So how, how long will it take from a student from NIP to go to CHK, which is the gym. Uh, typically, it will take, well, for me, that would be around 20 minutes. The least amount of time would be around 12 minutes. So we already have measured that. And it's a very simple uh, thing to ask students to log it in their phones and then just report it at some point. So I asked se several students, over, around 100 students already, to do this for me and log their point A, point B, point C, and the times at which they went. But this is not very easy to do in a scale larger than UP because then you would have to ask several uh, millions of pedestrians all around the city as well as the cars, etc. Waze has been doing this by automating, by using your cell phone. However, it only looks at the travel times. Uh, it doesn't follow you uh, when you go into your classroom. It does not follow you when you go from one building to another when you're walking. It only works when you're in a car. Uh, it assumes that you're in a car. Now, on the other hand, we can build um, uh, instruments, for example, a camera, where you can use this camera data or image data and extract traffic from this. I think Ms. Dr. Lim has a project like that. Uh, you can, we can also use uh, Bluetooth, for example, in our phones. And we actually tested this with UP Baguio, actually, uh, in, a, in the Paragbenga uh, Festival. So we asked some of our volunteers to actually merge with the whole uh, Paragbenga uh, crowd. And we were tracking their cell phones just to see if we can actually track in bulk a whole crowd moving in a narrow street. Uh, we were projecting to do this in the Nazareno Festival, which is a very hard problem to do. <laughs> However, we start with something small like that in Baguio. These things are available. These things we can do already. But uh, as May said, there's data and there's uh, big data. And uh, we have to find a way to extract the most uh, information from the amount of data that we already have several students walking around in campus, several phones with Bluetooth in a crowd. Then we can now try to see if using those, we can validate models that are available or predict uh, data. My, uh, I, my, my, my question of my student is, uh, kapag lumabas ba ako dito sa NIP at tinignan ko ang traffic sa Katipunan, traffic ba mamaya pagdating ko sa Makati? Mm. Uh, and he tried to work on this problem and he found out, well, at least he can predict 68% most of the time, the traffic situation when I arrive in Makati. Of course, it's not always 100%, but 68 is better than guessing 50-50. Uh, and I think there are a lot of in improvements that can be done with the model of that student if we had better data. We were just using the MMDA data set. Yeah, I have a question for both of you. 
uh, one of the may, one of the malaking problema natin is especially for travelers though, how to get to the airport on time okay so uh, i think for our viewers uh, this would be uh, some of our viewers are overseas these are very this is a very important piece of application That's good. Uh, how to get to the airport on time so if you get to naia uh, how long will it take me to go to get to my house let's say in bulacan so, uh, how could your models or studies uh, give advice to our travelers, so they uh, and also to the airport authorities? Uh, what is what would be the probability or the, the chance that uh, people will be late for their flights? For, for example, that's that's actually a very great great question. Yeah. Uh, I think. We don't need to make a model right now for that. The data, that. That can be answered right away. Because right now, for example, Google Maps would offer yeah. your Google traffic yeah, scenario and tell you, as, give you an estimate of how long it would take to go from point A to point B. And the quick answer, by the way, to that is travel at 4 a.m. Between 2 a.m. <laughs> and 4 a.m. 12 midnight to 4 a.m. That will be a consistent yeah. number. Yeah. Of We've 30 looked to at 40 it. Minutes. It's the best time to travel to the airport, from the airport to the airport. On the other hand, avoid Wednesdays. <laughs> I do the, it's, it, it's interesting. We thought Mondays would be the worst time to travel, let's say along, even along EDSA. But it turns out it's Wednesdays. And this work, we, we've actually started this just two weeks ago when you know, there was this brouhaha about, OK, let's keep the trans DNVS unnamed. <laughs> <laughs> but it was one of those things that we, 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 were, we asked uh, to traffic improve because they were suspended. Mm -hmm. And it was, it's hard to answer that. But uh, the interesting thing is because of that question, we were led to the idea to, to figure out, we gathered data for about two weeks now, and it's consistent. Wednesdays are bad to travel, bad days to travel. Best time, no traffic is really midnight to 4 a.m. And it's actually true that on EDSA, there's really not much, con uh, the concept of a rush hour is pretty gone already. It's like, it goes up and hardly There's goes down no and it goes down no at the end. Up, no reprieve. Yes, no reprieve at yeah. all. So to that question, to from the airport, fairly, I mean, if you have to travel now, tomorrow, Google can help you with that. But you know, the problem really is, I think, the question. Do we really need the airport here? Or oh. <laughs> can we move? Well, As I said, it's a, it's a transportation yeah. question. If we limit our questions to just the travel, travel uh, throughput time, the throughput or the travel time, then we will just be looking at it in the context of optimizing this for whatever uh, parameter you want. Shorter times, shorter distances, larger volumes, etc. But there's another side of that. Uh, the fact that the airport is here right in the middle of the city where we can actually move it somewhere else and have a high-speed train line. So these things has to be factored in if you want to really solve the problem of traffic. Data can only tell you so much, but policy really has to feed on whatever the data sets can tell you. The sad problem is sometimes the projects the project lifetimes, uh, so planning lifetimes of projects is several decades already. And when they get to be implemented, the data where they were based on is probably not real anymore. And um, for example, in the US, they actually have this problem when they planned all their freeways based on 1950 data, yeah. where the automobile was actually rising up. And then suddenly now, since 2004, that there is a decline of automobile uh, usage uh, by the so-called millennials. Uh, and now you have too many freeways, uh, too little uh, public um, utilities, etc. And therefore, it's a problem that they based their data on the 1950s. Now, I don't know about the projects here in Metro Manila and in other areas in the country, uh, but we have to review actually, all of these projects that are being proposed, especially in the light of the build, build, build uh, directions of the current administration. They will have a very uh, intense building of infrastructure that we, it might really ease it, the, the, the volume problem, it might ease it for a while, 
but there's a general rule actually in transportation. If you build it, they will come. In other words, if you expand your, your lanes to several lanes, like make it eight lanes, cars will actually fill it up and your, uh, throw, uh, your travel time will not be any better than the rest, except for a short, very short transitory phase. And so that's a problem. We have to look at it not only in the throughput time, travel time uh, perspective, but also on what is actually the correct way to approach the problem of transportation in general. So that's a very important point, um, Gani. This is complex dynamic system. It's a very important frontier uh, field of research in universities and uh, even in the private and government sectors. And um, traffic is symbolic of everything else that um, the government would like to address to benefit itself, uh, governance, as well as uh, the private sector and also uh, the individuals. So, um, Gani, you mentioned airport and road networks, and we should tell the public that presently there is going to be an airport uh, that will be fully functional, and the plan is to build the speed train. So that will decongest air traffic as well as road traffic. But even so, I experienced already a a great improvement in uh, time going to the airport only because of the Skyway. Now that connects with, is it? Um, the EIA Expressway. The EIA Expressway. Yeah. Just one intervention is good. Now we know that um, the government started in the last administration is also building this huge overpass and we're now suffering from uh, the traffic it's causing, but it's going to connect north and south and it's got exits, uh, about eight to 12 of them within uh, Metro Manila. And uh, earlier, Benji was saying, but that's another problem because the, um, the exits uh, could, could um, be you blocked. know, be blocked, okay? But I think it's uh, important to uh, tell our viewers that the government is trying to do something about it. But given the existing infrastructure, and um, because we know that in the university, we want to um, um, preach by example or teach by example, NIP is starting it with their own little uh, interventions and rules because they know it's right. So a certain system, a certain um, kind of um, order in the way uh, we move or transport ourselves and things is important. Do you think, Benji, that we could expand this to uh, the National Science Complex, the College of Science, and the whole UP, Diliman community, URD, environmentalist, ecologist, do you think that a reward system would be good for the community, students, faculty, staff, a little reward to get uh, the right data to contribute to the big data using maybe some apps that you could develop and using some um, instruments or sensors or what, cell phones, uh, you know, that would deliver us to us objective or non-subjective data. So, maybe. Yeah, uh, actually some, someone has made a study on that, that uh, uh, one of the grad students at, in the geography department at the College of Social Science and Philosophy. Uh, she, uh, Trina Listanko, she mm. did mm. a study on how on the, how students in UP Diliman perceive the way by which they move from th their class to the next class. And uh, this was at the age before the smartphone. Mm. <laughs> it was done about 10 years ago. So uh, what happened is, uh, what resulted was that uh, there, the students move from point A to point B, and there seems to be some gender differences on how they move. <laughs> so that's, that came out in her study. I don't know if that's the same today. So 
probably it's, uh, students are really willing to volunteer because uh, she had a sample size of 300 <laughs> students and they the all system. Yeah, volunteered for it. But that's the, one of the more interesting results. Uh, women tend to move in certain places while the men move, tend to move in certain places to get to the same class. <laughs> well, one of yeah. the, the problems that we actually find when we try to use instrumented tracking is the amount of um, information you actually get. Mm. Uh, and uh, one problem with this is that they don't really want to be tracked all the time. Uh, and therefore, uh, we, we limit the, the tracking only at the times when they exit the, the, the building and to the next point that they come. This is a very simple non-electronic solution. We actually give them cards, mm. yellow or orange yeah. cards, yeah. Uh, to give them, That's and good. then they just submit it to a drop box in the and and, yeah, and that's a very simple way to track them um, without being so intrusive about it. We actually do have developed in very uh, intrusive, quote unquote, uh, tracking devices. But we use this for, well, we plan to use this for cats uh, in the cats. university because uh, we ha actually have a feline problem yes. uh, in the oh. university, but it's not, uh, the solution is not to take them out. The solution is to find out their ecology, how they, they move, and then plan, just like the traffic we're doing. The, <laughs> so these are very small devices that we can track um, for a week or so and attach it to the back of the animal. This ones we can also use for volunteers, and some of them actually volunteers volunteered to use this, uh, but of course not all. Uh, but if you make it very simple and very uh, just small, just to give them a small, not remuneration, just a recognition that they participated in this project. So it's sometimes enough for them to uh, actually track for uh, several weeks. So we actually have several weeks of continuous data for students who volunteered even uh, when they went out to their dorm, they went out to a date, etc. Of course, we anonymize this when you, you use this. Uh, it's a privacy but, issue. But privacy. once they, you, you get to get to understand the individual when they move. And I think that's another problem of this, uh, another aspect of this problem of traffic, how the individual actually perceives uh, moving from point A to point B. Uh, and I think the work of Trina um, is also important in that regard. So just to follow up on that, so the issue of privacy is actually a very big deal. I mean, uh, on the one end, we say we want to have crowdsourced data, but then that could be very intrusive to someone. Yes. And on the other extreme, we have also this mindset that why do we need the data? Could we just empower the user? Uh -huh. And so that in yes. that, uh, in that, in with that mindset, what we would do is create the apps that would allow them to download yes. the app, yes. to look at it. And so they, their own data is just theirs, and they look at the things that we can normally calculate, and they, would, they could evaluate what, they, what we normally evaluate for them. Mm -hmm. And with the hope that by having that information, a, an end user would you know, make certain decisions to change behavior. To, Mm -hmm. and, and, and that is, uh, of course, yes, as I was saying, it's, a, it's trying to change certain mindsets, and that's one aspect that I we try to do That's very, very well. important. Uh, you started with a statement, changing mindsets, and um, that's a, a noble goal of um, training and education in the university. So there seems to be some um, ordering principles that um, are obvious to all of us, and so they could be the basis for guidelines on how to uh, deal with traffic, not just as an individual, but as a community. Because uh, on the other hand, if you want to uh, get an individual to um, use an app uh, to uh, decide for himself, he will decide in an individualistic way. And then when the time comes, so it's a competitive way too. And the time comes when the machines are going to make the decisions for us based on the uh, analysis of this complete data. 
uh, of the surroundings, then um, you know the machines will um, the artificial intelligences or the uh, machine intelligences will kind of tell us what to do. That's another another major topic for this <laughs> science innovation series. But uh, for the moment, we have to think of how we would manage traffic in this area. Say, UP Diliman is a big enough community. And there are elders, there are uh, seniors, there are uh, middle-aged ones and the young ones. There are also children. And then um, you have a pretty highly educated community that can be empowered, can be um, incentivized to collect the data, some level of data the as a basis for... The perhaps. study that we're doing right now, mm. fortunately or unfortunately happened during the transition of the roadworks here in UP Diliman. Mm. So for the viewers out there, uh, sometime a few months ago, several roads in UP was actually, were actually closed and the usual routes of the jeepneys were changed. So we had the data, a few months of data before the roadworks, and now we have the data of after the roadworks. So I'm looking at it in a more positive light. So now I can tell you about how the community actually changed, mm. uh, responded to these change, uh, uh, how people would change their moving patterns. Um, yeah. So the time cost from point A to point B has obviously changed when you ro ride the eco jeep, which is the internal uh, transportation inside the UP. When it's now go and passes here in CP Garcia instead of the usual route in fine arts. Uh, so how do students actually respond? How do, do the communities in Cruz and uh, uh, actually do they still ride the jeepney? Uh, because it will take you, a penalty would be around 10 minutes added the, uh, time on your uh, trip. And uh, it, it would be interesting actually to see whether it will come back to the original uh, pattern. Um, hopefully, the roadworks will finish in a few months again so that we can still see what will happen um, afterwards uh, when we track the, when we continue on tracking the pedestrians uh, even after the project is actually finished. There are very two important points that were mentioned yeah. just now and I just want to highlight them because they're, they're great. Mm -hmm. One is that solutions are actually very local. Empiric local. Solutions to traffic to are empirical same. and local. Very important. And the second is the role of data is not just about collecting them, it's not an end goal. It's a way for us to assess whether solutions Important. work yes. or whether there's a problem to begin with. So that's what we try to use our yes. data for, not yes. just yes. to end that, okay, we have the data. Okay. And, and, and that, those are very important, that solutions are very empirical, very local in, in nature. So uh, I think it's important to uh, emphasize the point that um, rather than just think of what the government uh, should do for us in terms of the infrastructure or uh, the rules and regulations, we have to think of um, how we can um, help solve the problem ourselves. And um, when we say ourselves, that includes the, um, uh, the private sector. And we also know that the private sector, while contributing significantly to the traffic, because there is unabetted uh, development of say condominium complexes along EDSA, okay? Um, then there's no way uh, for the uh, MRT to um, support this kind of a uh, population uh, movement. As you say, no matter how many roads we build, if you build them, they will come. So there must be a government uh, macro plan or national plan for creating what we call hubs and spokes. And I also know that uh, the government in um, the central um, Luzon region is going to build uh, the uh, new Clark City, which is going to be a um, chartered city. So they're going to control the way it's being planned and they're going to um, make it a smart city and it's gonna be smart for traffic. But um, the private sector, we're talking about the big, big uh, investors they're also trying to help uh, build what you call live, work, 
and play communities just to try to reduce the traffic. Of course, you still have to go out of town because it's boring always to go to the mall, you know, do the shopping and the eating in the, your place of work and your uh, residence. No? But think again about what we have in UP communities, biggest of which is UP Diliman. But you have the whole UP system with eight um, constituent universities, each with its unique ecology, no? unique traffic level. So um, then there's the surroundings. UP Diliman has the Katipunan Loyola area, and then we have good neighbors like uh, Ateneo and Miriam who, had, who have the same um, interests as us to ease the traffic. So we could actually expand whatever we start in, started in NIP and then uh, UP Diliman to this whole community. And you had told me also that this SM North is pretty well managed, no? So that's all within our community. It could become um, a model. So Benji, I think uh, at this point, you might have some thoughts on how we can empower this community to try to um, change the mindset to follow certain rules about lifestyle, about schedules, about, you know, uh, walking when you don't have to um, take a vehicle or do carpooling, things like this. Because you also um, lived and worked in Ateneo, right? <laughs> <laughs> That's so nice. Not really. <laughs> but I used to teach there <laughs> for, for, teach. for a semester. <laughs> well, anyway, uh, you know mindset. well, uh, <laughs> I think uh, one of the solutions, and, and I spoke with uh, Paolo Alcacer, a landscape architect, who's going mm. to give a talk to one of my classes in October mm -mm. in the Science Technology Society. Uh, he advocates that uh, all planning should be local and everything should be walkable yeah. so for instance uh, exactly. here in uh, here in this area no uh, diliman after diliman miriam the commercial center of town center even techno hub and if you're really for fitness even sm north they're walkable from diliman <laughs> yeah. yeah they are the yeah. thing is uh live work and play how life. can we make uh people walk <laughs> <laughs> That's the now uh, as May told me earlier before the sh before the show, uh, mall owners can really make their mall goers walk <laughs> along the mall. Now uh, there should be some sort of oh, walking uh, regimen. Uh, no, no, no uh, they go all over the place. <laughs> mm. So anyway, uh, I think what we everything should be walkable, and UP Diliban I think has assets to make natural assets like the trees, especially the ac ac acacia trees, uh, to make the whole campus walkable. Yeah, but uh, based on uh, the studies that done by my students in STS, uh, one of the major factors that discourage them from walking is not really that the climate is hot or it's raining, it's because sure. the sidewalks aren't really Mm. built for walking and I think this is true for a lot of the municipalities as in the country like uh, architect Alcazarin mm. uh, told the, the audience at the National Museum two weeks ago yeah. one, so, one of the things that we actually did as well is to extend the study to UPLD so I asked a colleague Dr. Uh, Ranzibel Rojas um, she is now collecting data as well on UPLB because we cannot really look at uh, travel times only in, well, f at least for UP, uh, only for UP Diliman and assume it will be the same for the exactly. rest. Iba -iba. And uh, uh -uh. UPLB has this Kaliwa Kanan uh, routes for their, eco their own jeepneys, the one that goes to forestry has a different route from the rest. And therefore, it has its own dynamics. And um, we want to see what is the same yeah. and what is different from both campuses. And, uh, and, uh, I, and I think uh, walking as well, uh, it's not just the jeepneys, and since it's a pedestrian study. We also want to see what makes them walk more in UPLB uh, than in Diliman, um, because we want to see 
well, because the end of goal of the project is to actually propose a uh, route for the ECOT, route for the Toki, route for uh, walking that is synchronized with the schedules of the students. Because sometimes the ECOT Jeep would actually wait for a very long time, no, but no students are coming in, uh, coming out of the building because it's not yet dismissal time. And, uh, and then when everybody comes out, 300 or 400 plus in NIP, for example, there's a very few uh, jeepneys that are waiting for them. So these things we really have to deal not only in terms of traffic, uh, but also in planning for how can you make the rest of those who did not get a ride walk very fast so that they can meet the and not be late in the next class. So I know it's, it's really human uh, behavior and lifestyle that is a major determinant of how efficient our transport or our um, traffic uh, movements would be. And uh, I can think of one good um, reason to walk, and that's uh, for health and wellness. And it's got to be brisk walking. <laughs> but then our uh, classes should start maybe uh, five minutes uh, after uh, you know the, the, the break, so that people have a, the time to walk. Now, we know that in UP Diliman, Chancellor Michael Tan had this plan to um, build a um, bike lane. And we already had this plan to come up with rentable bikes that can be secured. So I think that should be pursued. But for the pedestrians, the ones who really love to walk briskly, okay, we need covered courts. So UP Diliman could really be a model for other academic communities and uh, most eventually um, urban and rural communities. So um, then again, there are those who, n who cannot avoid traveling to another location, a distant location, say between UP Diliman and LB or between Quezon City and Makati. So we already know that um, you know, operations like Uber or Grab, um, together with Waze and Google Maps, have influenced the way we uh, manage uh, transport and traffic. So we would like uh, just a brief comment from May and uh, Ghani regarding this. We're sort of running out of time and uh, there's just so much um, for us to discuss, but I think it's important to um, tell the public how this is affecting us positively. Okay. Or not? Well, for one thing, I think that TNBS, like Uber, uh, grab and all the rest. Uh, this actually makes for uh, users aware of situations outside of what they can see and therefore plan their route uh, effectively. Uh, of course, that's on top of the data that Uber and the rest are gathering. But I would like actually to have a more integrated solution, not just uh, one that is left only to Uber or left yes. only to Grab, etc. Uh, I don't know if they would share data, probably not, but uh, the MMDA can actually feed into their data and I think they have a memorandum of agreement with them, uh, but the MMDA should also tap actually uh, studies that we can do, for example, here in the university. On the other hand, I'd just like to add to, for a final comment that we also have to exploit other uh, areas, for example, the waterways. Um, we have a very wide waterway. Of course, everybody does not like Pasig River because of the smell, etc. But it's, but it's not the smell, but and it's already a very um, it's a river that cuts across the sure. whole Metro Manila, the whole Metro, and as well as that, you also have the Laguna Lake system, it would take you three to four hours to go to Baras. But if you actually have a, a ferry that you could, could build, bring you there, we can decongest a lot of the city by bringing uh, other people away, uh, not really away, but make them accessible to the metro and not stay here for the rest. So that maximizing whatever we have is actually very important. So, May, yes, yeah. I'm sure you have yeah. lots to say more. Uh, well, for me, uh, companies like Uber and Grab, they serve a very uh, a nice purpose, which is 
they're helping potential car owners not own a car. <laughs> I mean, I'm one, for example. I, I, li I like their services. I, I use their service. And it's because I don't need, I, I'm, I'm not, I don't want to think about parking. I don't want to think about parking at home or even in, uh, where, where I'm going. So Sorry. they do serve a purpose. Yeah. But at the same time, we always all, should also see the other side of the coin wherein one more Uber, one more Grab vehicle might be too much. But only if you know, there's an excess, excess in supply versus demand. And as a result, they're going to be stopped somewhere. And therefore, they're going to be part of the problem. Right. But it's a balancing act. And yeah, having, and it, it seems that economics would, you know, would exactly. guide the principle whether those cars would disappear from the system altogether. Exactly. But there's also some form of regulation that's also being done, you know, which, for example, could, in terms of data, they could track how long uh, the response time between uh, hailing a, an Uber and getting one would, would take, mm -hmm. or how long a driver actually waits for, a, for uh, someone to hail him. So these are things that could be data driven, and these are things, and they do serve a, a purpose. Uh, on the other extreme, uh, we, when we talk about, let's say, uh, Google and, uh, and uh, Waze, they do have some exchange uh, of data with local governments. So it's just a matter of local governments being able to tap those sources. And uh, Uber, uh, I almost forgot, Uber actually has an initiative called Uber Movement, wherein they uh, share some form of aggregated anonymized data mm -hmm. that tells you the travel time between points A and B. Mm -hmm. And their data is actually open, so, uh, uh, open source. It's accessible. But again, the level of anonymization that they've already done and aggregation that they've already done might not be sufficient for our purposes already. So there are ways to, to do this. And we actually are going to start to try to reach out to them soon. So uh, there are ways to improve this. May, yesterday, I was on my way back from Los Baños. And I was asked to uh, pass uh, through C5 and then Temple Drive to EDSA. And I wondered why. And so we decided to take uh, C5 all the way to uh, Blue Ridge and Katipunan. And there was no traffic. So <laughs> there ways to improve these uh, you know, monitoring apps. And um, well, I'm happy to say that um, NIP and our uh, engineers from the College of Engineering are working on these with major funding from our government. Mm -hmm. But Ghani um, is a leader of a Visor program that is funded by the uh, University of the Philippines, stands for Versatile Instrumentation for Science, education and Science, Education, and Research. So there are ways for uh, Ghani's team to come up with uh, monitoring uh, sensors that would help problems such as traffic. But I think, Benji, you've got to have the last say on this because you are the ecologist. So, uh, you know, what's the game plan for UP? For UP? Uh, well, I suppose uh, we have to make the campus uh, well, in my opinion, should be walkable <laughs> for all. Mm. Uh, promote transportation that doesn't emit uh, greenhouse gas. Yeah. And I think so there I should be a way to regulate the entry of vehicles because it's a university campus. It's not a commercial district. So mm. I think uh, there must be a way. And I think the university has started by having a sticker scheme. Not a, if you don't have a sticker, you yes. can only pass certain routes. Precisely. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but the university, I think it's a good... Um, model. It's a uh, UP Diliman is as big as a small city. Exactly. So yes. whatever we come out here may be applicable to other cities, especially regional cities of the Philippines, like uh, like Iloilo, for instance, where uh, a lot of the development is really positive. So yeah, I think I would have to agree with that, Benji. That there should be some rules. I wouldn't say dictated, but strongly. Uh, implemented from the top because they're obviously the right rules and uh, it's really based on uh, your good ends when your fellow neighbors good begins so there's always this balancing and so um, I think stickers on follow the rules or don't uh, be a you know a pollution belcher those things are important because ultimately it's the individuals who must live healthy, productive uh, lives, long lives uh, in the university and um, 
in the rest of uh, Philippine community. So with this uh, very uh, rich, stimulating discussion on uh, traffic, which affects our everyday lives, we hope that our viewers will keep tuning into science innovations in TV up. No way but up, TV UP. Maraming salamat po sa inyong lahat. Magandang araw.